All right, welcome everybody. I'm Sam Glassenberg, CEO and founder of LevelX. And today I'm gonna to talk about how frontline medical professionals are preparing themselves for all sorts of unforeseen scenarios using video games with lessons and techniques that I think we're gonna find are relevant not only in medicine, but in education in general. And the bottom line is that when doctors play video games, society wins. And this session is gonna be a series of examples and demos of just that. Um, so first off, a little bit about me. Um, I've spent my career starting actually in video game development at companies like LucasArts and Microsoft. Um, and at Microsoft, my job was basically, my team's job was to predict and plan the next 10 years of video game graphics technology. And this is where I really got to see the sort of huge gap between the state of the art and what we're doing in entertainment and what we're seeing in, well, specifically medical education. So let's talk about video games. So my team's job at Microsoft was to figure out how we go from characters that looked like this in a video game at the turn of the millennium, it looks kind of realistic, but still you can see the triangles, to characters that look like this. So today I can go to my favorite video game store and for $50 I can buy a copy of Call of Duty. I've got a dozen soldiers on screen at once. I can zoom into the eye of one of the characters and this is the level of detail with which we're creating a character's eye in a modern video game. Let's contrast this, all right, now to the state of the art in medical training. Let's sit down in front of a $250,000 eye surgery simulator. Looks like it fell out of a gumball machine. For those of us that play video games, this is what, 1992. Here the eye is the entire focus of the product. Here the eye is an afterthought to make the character a little more engaging. And the bigger challenge is that eye cannot capture the rare and difficult scenarios that occur during eye surgery. Now this gap, the visual technology gap, that's the gap you can see. The bigger gap is the gap you can't see, which we call the neuroscience gap. Because the video games industry over the last three decades has distilled an incredibly deep discipline that we've tested on billions of players. We figured out the neurochemical recipe for driving learning at scale among any audience. Expert game designers know how to hit that perfect balance of reward and frustration, of challenge and skill, to trigger dopamine releases in the brain at the right frequency to maximize learning and maximize behavior change. And it's incredibly effective, case in point. So the Obama administration spent many years, approximately two to three billion dollars to try to stem the obesity epidemic. How do we get Americans just to stand up, just to just, just get off the couch and go for a walk. All of these meritorious efforts eclipsed within 48 hours by a single video game that had 40 million Americans up and walking for miles. Now, I don't know what the situation was in downtown San Diego, but in downtown Chicago, where I'm from, it was a zombie apocalypse for three weeks. And there are no kids in downtown Chicago. That's because the average age, a player of Pokemon Go, their age was in, the, uh, in their upper 20s, early 30s. Now this example is well known, but every video game is doing this. It's driving user behavior. Whether it's getting you to go for a walk, or pick up your phone every day to play, or invite your friends, video games drive behavior change and they drive learning. There's a reason why half of these players can name 80 Pokemon characters and give you their entire backstory, but can't show you where Switzerland is on the map. You're welcome, that's because video games are incredibly good at driving learning as an indirect or unintended consequence of play. So at Level X, we're closing this technology and neuroscience gap. We're taking the top video game designers, engineers, artists from the video games industry, the experts who've made Call of Duty and Mortal Kombat and Words with Friends, and we've teamed them up with hundreds of physician experts and contributors across every major medical specialty to use this technology and design to achieve good for society, right? To capture the greatest challenges of the practice of medicine as video games. All these game designers, all these artists using their skills to achieve social good. We have over 750,000 medical professionals playing these games on their smartphones, earning continuing medical education credit while they cut and cauterize and inject and diagnose on a totally interactive virtual patient. I will now show you an example. Um, those of you who know me uh, know that I always like to start a demo with a colonoscopy, because that's the best. Uh, so I'm just demoing this here on my phone. 
Um, I'll start out with GastroX. Everything I'm showing you is available for free in the App Store, so feel free to download it yourself if you don't believe me. Uh, so we have a few hundred thousand medical professionals playing this game. It's filled with dozens of rare, difficult, unforeseen cases, the kinds of cases that you can really only train for on a live human being. Um, and you can just play them here on your phone. You can earn CME credit. Uh, so here we'll do this one. Okay. And again, I'm just, this is, this is my phone, so ignore any text messages that I get during the demo. Uh, so here, this is not a, just an interactive video. This is a totally interactive virtual patient. What do I mean by that? Well, this patient, this patient's squishy. The tissue moves. I can grab anything anywhere, and it behaves just like it would in real life. So here in a routine polypectomy, I need to find all the precancerous polyps. They hide behind folds. I gotta push tissue around to find them. Here I've got one that's out in the open, so I'll just grab it with my forceps and remove it. But what I don't realize is this is a rare scenario where the polyp embeds on a blood vessel. So when I remove it, I trigger a bleed inside the body. So here we have full 3D computational fluid dynamics running on a cellular phone, you know, that thing that drops your calls all the time. Um, and so now I need to spray water, try to stop the bleed. The patient just, just dilutes the blood. We gotta take more drastic action. We'll do audience choice. Argon plasma or epinephrine? Really? Plasma, all right, good call. We'll use our argon plasma coagulator, cauterize the wound, excellent choice. Objective achieved, bleeding stop. Good job, everybody. Now I've got this mess of blood, uh, polyps hiding in this sort of mess of blood over here. You don't wanna watch me find, find them under there. It's a totally interactive virtual patient. I can cauterize anywhere. Hippocratic Oath doesn't apply. Um, the tissue behaves realistically until eventually it caused so much damage you fail the case. Um, okay, so this is, this is again sort of one example of using video game technology for good. Um, and so, but we can also do this quickly. So when COVID hit last year, demand from our players was pretty overwhelming, right? So we had patients that were literally dying in ERs in New York, because when you assume that everybody coming in has COVID, somebody showing up with a pulmonary embolism is very likely to be misdiagnosed. So we took a reductive reasoning diagnosis puzzle, which I'll demo for you in a second, uh, that we had originally developed for cardiology, and we quickly launched a bunch of game levels levels uh, in our pulmonology game to teach you how to differentiate between COVID and diseases that present like COVID. Um, and getting somebody on a ventilator isn't just a matter of, you know, shoving a tube down their throat. Managing the airway is an incredibly complex decision-making process. It's a strategy game. And luckily, we had already built one for the American Society of Anesthesiologists. Now, the rules actually all had to change with COVID. If you followed the standard airway guidelines from ASA on a COVID patient, you were likely to damage their friable airway. And you could actually aerosolize the virus if you follow the guidelines for how to oxygenate the patient. You just put everyone in the room at risk. So we're a game, so we wanted to update the game rules. But the problem is, we couldn't find any. The first that we could find were actually in Italian because the Italian anesthesia societies were the first ones to deal with this. They had dealt with COVID first. So we updated our game using the Italian guidelines and then we updated them again um, from C uh, with the guidelines from CDC and ASA when they caught up. So I can show a quick example of, of one of these games. Here, we'll jump into, we'll jump into airway. Um, and so here, this is, a, you know, this is an example game. This is a strategy game. And this is, of course, you know, there's a lot less 3D here. Um, but we'll go over, and again, you can play this on your own if you want. Uh, my first patient presents, he doesn't have COVID, so we'll jump through him quickly. But this is, a, this is a strategy game where you're presented with a sequence of patients, so you can practice on dozens and dozens and dozens of different patient scenarios and try different approaches. So this patient is COVID negative, so I'll just innovate him quickly. Guidelines say if you try and make an attempt and it, uh, with a technique and it fails, try again. And then now we start get, getting harder and harder, more difficult patients. So this patient's COVID positive. You can see her oxygen saturations or pretty low, um, and now I have to make the right sequence of decisions in order to get my patient, uh, in order to get my patient ventilated. Um, so here, for example, you know, I can pre-oxygenate, but if I use the standard technique, I'll oxygenate my patient. So she'll be able to, you know, she'll, her oxygen saturation goes up, but it says, ah, you used the old technique. If you use um, if you actually bag ventilate the patient, you risk the, you increase the chance of aerosolizing the virus and putting other people in the room at risk, right? So you can play through these cases over and over again, trying different approaches. And what'll happen is at the end, you can compare your decisions against 
the standard of care against the guidelines, because guidelines are incredibly complicated to memorize. There are these complicated flowcharts that you're being sent in the middle of a pandemic when you're stressed out and you can't sleep and you're not getting much sleep. Here, instead of trying to memorize a complex flowchart, we can just let you play a game. Try it. Try dozens of patients, go through the flowchart and understand the different trade-offs you need to make. Okay. Um, so let's keep going. Um, another important issue from the past year, not just COVID, um, where recent events have really brought to light long-standing racial inequalities in our society, and healthcare is no exception to that. Um, just one example, dermatology. It's been long known that people of color do not get the same quality of care when they go to the dermatologist. Now, they're, they're more likely to be misdiagnosed. Now, why is this? <clears throat> it's not out of malice on the part of the doctor. The doctor simply hasn't seen enough cases of uh, your skin, rare skin condition on skin, on your skin tone in, in order to be able to recognize it. It's not his or her fault. They don't see enough patients of color in their practice. And the literature, like the reference books, there is like a total dearth of reference images for many, many, many skin diseases on skin of color. Now, games can actually solve this problem. So our artists and engineers at Level X built upon some of the best skin rendering technology, some of this from the games industry, some of the stuff you saw at the beginning. And we created a pipeline, a tool set, that allows us to generate any skin disease on any part of the body on skin of any color. And then we built a game using brain training mechanics to feed this content into. So dermatologists can train their brain to recognize these diseases on patients that they don't see every day and where there is no reference photo in the literature. So all these examples I'm showing you, these are not photographs. These are completely computer generated images coming off of our game pipeline or game engine, right? In order to recreate rare diseases on a wide range of skin tones and on different parts of the body. Um, another challenge presented by COVID. So in-person um, in -person training in medicine basically came to a complete and screeching halt uh, in a lot of areas. So cadaver labs, one of the main ways that we train on new surgical devices, um, were completely closed. Same with simulation centers, training centers, right? Places where teams would come together to train on a mannequin or a, or a simulated patient. Uh, we couldn't do this during COVID. Hundreds of thousands of surgical trainers and medical science liaisons were, you know, that used to be able to go from clinic to clinic and from operating room to operating room. Now we're trying to train people using PowerPoint over Zoom. Okay. So in order to solve this problem, at Level X, we built upon cloud gaming technology, which is the kind of tech that's driving platforms, if you've heard of PlayStation Now or Project xCloud from Microsoft. And we repurposed a lot of these ideas to create a collaborative cloud gaming platform for medical and surgical training. So a group of people thousands of miles apart can practice surgery together on a virtual patient simulated in the cloud. Now the internet connection here at the show, if you haven't noticed, is pretty terrible. I'm having trouble checking my email, but you know, we'll give it a try. Um, okay, so first thing I'm going to do, so over here on the right, you can see this little web browser that I opened up with a link and I'm gonna press play and now I've got my virtual patient here. But what I can also do is sort of anybody can, can do this. Um, what, I'm, what I can also do is here, I can just give myself a QR code. Here, let me go switch, I'll turn on my phone so you can see that too. So you can see my camera and then you can see what's going on on my phone. So here, we're live everybody, hello. Um, so now I'm gonna use my QR code reader. Hopefully it's not too bright, there we go. And I'll open this also on my phone. We're really gonna stress the network here. And I could do this from you know, thousands of miles apart. And so here what I can do is on my computer, right? I can start doing this procedure. And you'll notice that I'm seeing the exact same thing on my phone. Right, so I can go and I can place these retractors using on my computer. I can be the host, the trainer. And now me, the learner, a thousand miles away on my phone, I can interact with the same virtual patient. So over Zoom, a group of up to 16 people at once can be interacting with the same virtual patient doing surgery. Now this surgical procedure is not actually being simulated on the phone like the colonoscopy before it or on my computer. All this is just running in the cloud. 
So on the cloud, we've got, um, we've got a system that's basically simulating all of this, and then I can access it from my phone, from my PC, even on a pretty bad internet connection, if anyone even tried to dare make a Zoom call from, uh, from the hotel internet, and it just works. So it's not a video, right? I press play on it like it's a YouTube video. There's no app to install, there's no download, but it's actually a totally interactive virtual patient that any number of people can come into um, and, uh, and and do surgery on, and I can share it just by sharing a QR code or in Zoom or MS Teams or WebEx, just share a link in the chat. Um, okay. Um, so the last example that I'll give is we talked about you know, surgical training, we talked about addressing racial disparities in healthcare. Um, we also have a multi-year grant from Trish, from NASA's Research Institute for Space Health, to apply these techniques and these technologies from the video games industry to train astronauts for medical emergencies on deep space missions, um, which presents some sort of really interesting scenarios. So you imagine you're nine months into the Mars mission, right? You're not even there yet. And all of a sudden, one of the astronauts, you know, grabs his or her chest and rolls over unconscious in microgravity. It's going to be the flight surgeon. You know, it's always the flight surgeon. You've seen movies. What are you going to do? Uh, well, first, your resources are limited. There's no MRI, there's no CT, there's no X-ray on, on, the, on the ship. The only thing you have is basically a handheld ultrasound probe. That's the only way to see inside the body. Okay, next problem, no precedent. The heart physically changes shape based on the amount of time you spent in microgravity. It becomes more spherical, blood flow changes. How do I know that what I'm looking at is normal for an astronaut who's been in space for nine months or abnormal? Next problem, no experts. Today they have an ultrasound rig up on the ISS, but the astronauts that go up get very little ultrasound training. There's a radiologist on the ground in Houston, I actually met with him uh, last week, um, and he's the one who's guiding them. Give me 10 degrees to the right, push in a little bit, and he's reading the results in real time. That's fine, there's less than a second of latency to get to the ISS, but en route to Mars, it can be up to a 40 minute round trip for the signal. So give me, ten, you know, all right, push a little bit to the right. It's going to be 40 minutes until you get the feedback. An, uh, an ultrasound exam would take about 12 hours. And then the next problem is there's no more time to train. Um, the astronauts that went on the Apollo missions, they had, you know, a year to train for what was a nine-day mission, right? Here the mission's going to take three years. The training's already booked. If we're going to train astronauts to do medical procedures in space and deal with emergencies, we have to either train them just in time or en route. And so what we've been working on is we've been working with NASA to use all of this technology and all of these game mechanics to train astronauts for medical emergencies on deep space missions that are going to take place later this decade. So in these examples here, we're actually using game technology and game hardware to simulate ultrasound. Right? The things that I showed you in the colon and you know, with, a, with a knee, this was all under visible light. But we actually use the same technology to recreate what procedures would look like under ultrasound, really with sound waves, or under, uh, under X-ray. So bottom line, when doctors and when astronauts play video games, it's a win for society. So hopefully, you know, we've had the short 20 minute talk, we maybe did about four or five demos. Hopefully this talk inspired you to think about ways that video game technology and design can be used to achieve not only educational objectives, but really help society as a whole to fight pandemics, to address racial disparities and bias, and to eventually get ourselves to Mars. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, I've actually got to run right after the talk to another meeting, but my email address is right up here, so feel free to reach out if you have any questions. And uh, thank you very much.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Taylor Shedd. I'm the founder and CEO of Stimuli Education, and I have a really cool story to share with you all today. So let's rewind back to March 2020, when most of us got the same announcement that public schools were going to shut their doors and students were going to end up on a really long spring break. My company's based in Dallas, and I have a partnership with the Dallas Independent School District. And that day I'm going through, I'm actually driving in the car and things are flipping through my mind like, okay, I know the district has a plan to distribute Wi-Fi to every student in the district. They're already ahead of the game there. I knew that they had a plan to make sure the devices were one-to-one -one and they just had to get them out to elementary school students. But what they did not plan for is what happens when students need to get online. So today you're gonna hear a story about what the Dallas Independent School District, Dr. Hinojosa, and the Dallas Education Foundation came together to do in order to accelerate learning and to reform the classroom and change it from the way that it's been over the last 100 years. So welcome to our educational metaverse. Our goal with this platform is to build a strong community by exponentially improving the student learning experience. Oftentimes in education, we're about measurable outcomes and oftentimes you're just trying to get to the next data point and you're not trying to say, what can we do to actually meet students where they are and to drastically improve student outcomes? And that's what we're aiming to do. Now, if any of you have ever tried to sell a product into education, you know one of the first things teachers, administrators, and anyone will ask you is, is this adding time to my teacher's day or is this saving time? So again, back to March 2020, I had this conversation with Dr. Hinojosa and the Dallas Education Foundation. They said, okay, Taylor, do what you need to do. So my team went to action and we built a full virtual school district that hosted all of Dallas ISD summer programs. So all those great things you all found out in the fall uh, with virtual learning where it was actually synchronous, where, oh my gosh, now all the students go on mute or um, they get really bored on Zoom after a long time. We had already discovered over that summer. And what Dr. Hinojosa said is, I need you to think a little bit bigger. So the thoughts you'll hear today and the action you'll hear today is just that, it's bigger. So uh, we started talking to different organizations like the Texas Education Agency, other school districts, and we most importantly, we talked to parents, teachers, and students, and what we found were that you can't solve the student engagement problem until you solve the amount of time that it takes for teachers to do the most simple task in the classroom. So the three problems that we're looking to solve here are how do we empower students by giving them a learning experience like unlike any other? How do we integrate applications that teachers are using every day in the classroom in order to save them time? And then how do we amplify data for how our students are performing so that a teacher in real time can make better decisions versus every six to nine weeks when those assessments are taken. So I'm so happy to introduce to you today a platform called Education OS. It's an operating system that connects the way our students, our users, the hardware and applications all work together. This has never been done before, but I want you to think about one simple thought. What if every teacher in America learned to use one simple application that connected to thousands of other applications that their school district chose to use? It's possible. So again, I've mentioned teachers clicking through many, many applications. A principal in Dallas ISD told me, Taylor, there's 23 applications and data sets I have to click through every single day. So my teachers are using multiple applications for grading, taking attendance, differentiating instruction, and personalized learning. Some of these applications and some of the things that our teachers are doing are not even done digitally yet. They're meeting in person, they're going over data, they're pulling how our students need to be accommodated in the classroom from binders. So with EdOS, we're seeking to change this. And as you can see, if you know anything about user interface design, the idea is that you take three clicks to get to the task that you want to do. We're taking attendance from something that's 30 clicks to one to two clicks. So again, I'm just gonna to speak to the main vision behind EdOS is a unified platform for the applications teachers and students use most. Now, one thing I don't want you to forget is students are using video games outside of school. So we wanna unify the entire experience. 
And where we wanted to start was with the four top learning management systems and student information systems. So again, I'm gonna make this picture very real for you all. Google Classroom, a lot of us used. A lot of school districts are using applications like PowerSchool. They do not talk to each other. So teachers grade over here, and then they have to go into another system and apply those grades. Teachers take attendance in one place, and they have to go and apply the attendance in another place. So we're merging all of those together. So um, one thing I should mention is sometimes when you're listening to folks talk, it's about a vision, and you're wondering, can they execute? This platform is being launched next Monday at Dallas Hybrid Prep. And Dallas ISD has said, Taylor, we want to be the laboratory for the rest of the entire globe to prove that Dallas ISD is the number one innovative school district in the world. But it needs to be done. And until a school district is standing by the innovators that are in the technology industry, it's going to be very hard to achieve success. So that's what we have here with this project. It's called Project Dream Big. If you ever see it online, it's referring to what we're doing with EdOS. So now I'm going to go through a little bit of what you're looking at on the screen here. So this grade book and attendance book was made by my designers. If you look at the grade book and attendance books that our teachers are using, they look so outdated. They're not user friendly. And in fact, I have many teachers saying, please help us. We don't like the way this technology works. So our application is pulling existing lesson plans from Google Classroom and loading them into a student gamified interface. I'll show you a demo in a second. We're pushing and pulling attendance from PowerSchool because that is the student information system that Dallas ISD utilizes. When teachers are creating lesson plans in our system, they're tied to state standards. So that means as a teacher, I can build a lesson plan. It can impact my students. And in real time, I can see what content was more impactful to that student and better inform my instruction for the following year. We're building interactive content with one of our content partners by the name of Kriki. It's like taking um, Nearpod and Pear Deck. If you're not an educator, what that is is it's making interactive videos, it's making interactive PowerPoints. It's something that students are able to engage with versus just stare and look at like a lecture. So we've integrated this all into one system. And what that's done for us is it's helped us create a super teacher. So let me tell you what you're looking at. Again, you're going to maybe learn way more about the classroom than you intended to today. In class every day, a teacher teaches to one standard. And at the end of the day or the end of the next couple of days, the teacher has to do something called a demonstration of learning, or some refer to it as an exit ticket, where they assess how that student has learned that standard. Well, if you look at this top user interface here, what you're looking at is four bands that students can fall on anywhere from does not meet, approaches, meets, or mastery. Most of the time, our educators are teaching to the bubble. They're teaching to the students that are far behind. And sometimes the students that are at mastery are being held back because they're not allowed to accelerate into the future. And we want to solve that with this system. So I'm going to walk you through how this works. A teacher builds a lesson plan. They load in interactive activities. They can press a button and launch it into the student's classroom. Those students engage in that content real time. And in real time, that teacher knows every question that that student has gotten right and every question that they've gotten wrong. And then they can decide what they want to do next with their lecture. So again, we want to amplify data so in real time, our teachers can address needs versus every six to nine weeks when we find out our students are not headed towards that category they need to be to pass the standards that they need to. So now we're, we're getting towards the fun part, back to the students. So if you talk to a lot of parents who uh, were having to monitor their students during virtual learning, what you heard is, oh yeah, my, my kid was playing video games while they were on Zoom. My kid was searching YouTube. I've heard that my student had two different Twitter accounts that they were posting on while they were in class. This solution is better than Zoom. You cannot expect our students to learn for the jobs of tomorrow if we are not giving them the tools and the access that they need. And one thing that's really important about this is I need to take a step back and tell you a little bit about the Dallas Independent School District. Dallas ISD has 151,000 students. It's the second largest school district in Texas. 96% of those students are economically disadvantaged, and about 50% of them are English language learners. So Dallas ISD wants to start small with Dallas Hybrid Prep 
and they wanna scale this up all across the district. But remember those demographics when I get to this next slide. So our educational metaverse looks unlike anything you've ever seen before. When we talk about gamifying education, we're not talking about just giving a student a point for getting a question right. What we're talking about is a student being able to select their avatar and their skin color. That's very important as well. They can walk through this world, and when it's time for them to get to class, they don't have to figure out how to get to class. A teacher presses a button, and they're launched from their game world right into their classroom. They engage in class within their avatar in a virtual conference that their teacher shows up in. And again, as a teacher launches an app, now the student isn't having to press tab to go into Khan Academy and then log in. Through single sign-on, they're getting right into the activities that they need. And again, the data flows right back to the teacher to give them what they need in real time. But there's something else really unique about this model when you put students within a video game and give them avatars and a world to play in. Every time a student turns in homework, shows up to class on time, helps a friend with the task, engages in social emotional learning or workplace learning, they're awarded with points. And then the student can take these points and upgrade their avatars. They can use it for building tools within this game world. They can buy real estate. They can design sneakers and sell to their friends. They can learn about the economy. Things right now that are not available in our classrooms. It gets even better. So, on the board of the Dallas Education Foundation is this wonderful gentleman by the name of Jim Keyes, who used to run 7-Eleven and Blockbuster. So let's say he knows about innovation. And uh, Jim said, can we make this where every time a student earns points, they get a micro scholarship, similar to how Raise Me does? So now imagine a student from a low-income school district, instead of having the thought that I'm gonna go into construction because that's what my family does, having the thought that, wait a minute, if I study a little more, I can earn a little bit more points and I can fill up that bank account and now college is accessible to me. Again, this sounds like a really big dream and it is, but we are making it happen in Dallas ISD with the Dallas Education Foundation and we're not doing it just for Dallas, we're doing it for everyone across the globe. So you might be wondering, Taylor, how are you doing this? This is a big project, are you doing it by yourself? The answer is no. We're working again with Dallas ISD, Dallas College, multiple industry partners, different curriculum providers. And I'll tell you, we want to integrate with as many people as possible. So if you have an application that's interactive, if you have content that's going into our classrooms, we want to make it just as easy for students everywhere to access your content in a way that's, learned, that's engaging for them. So you might be wondering what's next. One, um, Dallas ISD has 100 industry partners, and those industry partners are anybody from American Airlines, Microsoft, IBM, Southwest Airlines, Bell Helicopters, I could keep naming a few, and they've already committed to supporting the school district and have been partnering with the district over the last five years. And they've said, hey, Taylor, why don't we take an application like this and build digital career pathways? Sometimes it's hard for us to get Dallas students or any students within our headquarters, but within this game world, you can build a Toyota factory. And kids can learn about hydrogen cells, and they can talk to other people, and they can learn how to professionally dress, and they can practice mock interviews, all within this gamified world. So that's what's coming next with EdOS. And here's the kicker. We know that interactive content is what's going to drive this system and allow us to scale, grow, and sustain. So we're working on a game maker tool that will allow students, teachers, third-party application developers, and other companies to come into our world and build interactive experiences. Otherwise, these companies would have to hire Unity developers and manage a team and figure out how to work agile. But instead, we're gonna make a visual tool just like Roblox, or for others, think of YouTube and what YouTube did for creators and we're gonna make it possible for students to build their own learning experiences and to be empowered with their learning. So imagine as a student, my homework assignment is to go in and build an interactive experience teaching another student about the Million Man March from Martin Luther King. And then another student who might have a hard time grasping history is able to walk through and talk to Martin and talk to other people and get their perspective, immersive, engaging. It's never been done before, but that's what we're doing. 
So if you want to know what success looks like, we will know when we are successful, when students and most young adults are earning a livable wage. That's what we're after here. My first slide said we want to build communities by driving the student learning experience. That's exactly what we're focused on doing is driving this data point over a long amount of time. We're in it for the long haul. Other data points that you'll see on here is increasing attendance, which increases revenue to the school district. We want to increase the number of workforce credentials that students are earning within this system. We want to make sure that we're increasing the number of application integrations we're doing. We're not trying to do this by ourselves. So now I'll get to the fun part of the demo. Thank you guys so much for listening. If you want to follow the journey of what happens with EdOS and watch the data, you can follow at Stimuli Tech or at Future of Dallas, which is the Dallas Education Foundation's website. If you want to follow my personal journey and get my perspective, then Taylor at Stimuli.net is the way you contact me. But this is the exciting part right here. With EdOS, teachers spend less time on administrative tasks like grading and taking attendance and more time on facilitating and personalizing great instruction. Now it's time for our quiz. As soon as you're done, class is dismissed. Our system automatically calculates grades and sends it back to the student information system and saves our teachers a tremendous amount of time. They can launch their video chat or any of the new interactive materials into the student's classroom. Students use our avatar creator in order to select their attire, skin color, and hairstyle to represent themselves the exact way they want to in this virtual environment that enables them to connect and collaborate with friends, visit immersive industry partner experiences, and learn in a much more engaging way far superior to today's traditional classroom. Sophia can access her homework and assignments conveniently through her personalized game menu. In this example, Sophia missed class yesterday and there's no makeup packet for a teacher to create. As Sophia clicks on the class tab, she can access yesterday's past lessons, recorded lecture, and assignments. Today's class will be going over absolute value and piecewise functions. We know students love to communicate and collaborate with one another. The world and the invisible learning experiences we can offer students is limitless. This task is not too large. A lot of people say this and say it's going to be really difficult. And it will be but our students and our future is worth it. Thank you all so much.